Welcome to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with Zivi. I'm the host, Zivi Owens. I am an author. My latest is blank, pub date March 1st, a novel. I'm also a podcaster, obviously, a publisher, a bookstore owner, and so much more. If you love books, you're in the right place. In fact, we call it the Zivi-verse, or really, the LA Times called it the Zivi-verse, and we're going with it. Go to ZiviOwens.com to learn more and follow me on Instagram at ZiviOwens. Elba Iris Perez is the author of The Things We Didn't Know, a novel. Elba is from Aguas Buenas, Puerto Rico, and spent her early childhood in Moronco, Massachusetts. She taught theater and history at the University of Puerto Rico in Arecibo and now lives in Houston. She is the author of the El Teatro Como Bandera, a history of street theater in Puerto Rico. And please forgive my accent. I actually don't speak Spanish, which is embarrassing. If you'd like to go to Paris with me, I could probably order you a coffee. Welcome, Elba. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to Discuss the Things We Didn't Know, a novel. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, this book woke me up right away, literally on the edge of the cliff in the car, like, you know, the way you immerse the reader, like from the start, um, and then paint such a picture. It's such a world, like going to Puerto Rico and just, you're so good at creating experiences and worlds. I feel like I've literally gone on a trip. (laughs) Wow. That's fantastic. I'm glad. I really wanted to do that because War and Oko, where the novel is set, is such a beautiful place. Amazing. Okay, tell listeners what your book is about, please. So it is about a young girl, Andrea Rodriguez, who is nine years old. And it's a cross-cultural coming-of-age debut novel. And it explores uh, the life of a girl who is living in the 1950s between Puerto Rico and this place called Warnoco, Massachusetts, which is a small factory town. I didn't know if it was a real place or not. Is that embarrassing? Can I admit that? (laughs) It (laughs) is. With the cul-de-sacs and all of it, that's what it is. That's, it's like, is it frozen in time type of place? It was torn down. Oh, okay. And so parts of the streets that were there are still there, but the street where I grew up on, which is why I wrote the novel, was torn down. Got it. So it does exist, but it was torn down. Okay. You really, I have a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old, and I feel like you very well, you captured that mentality and point of view so well. How did you do that? Wow. I mean, I I really struggled with it because I'm not nine years old anymore. And so you have to get back to it. That place was just so vivid in my mind and it still is and it always will be. And that I just think the place brought me back to it in a very profound way that enabled me to get back in touch with that childhood. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, there's a domestic dispute factor, right? Where the family, I mean, I think I can say this, it was pretty early on where the family leaves and the the father stays and the mom is, is quite depressed, right? She does not want to be out of her native country. She's not happy. She is really trying hard to escape and you create that dynamic between them that is sort of fraught with tension and and fear so as you're reading you're like what's going to happen is he going to come back like how where is this going to go tell me a little bit about creating that type of not like borderline physical aggression and you're just like waiting tell me about that well i think i have to be honest and tell you that i was a theater professor hmm. for 25 30 years my background is theater. And so I just uh, visualized it and then tried to pause the writing in a way where the action stopped and I describe it. So it's like pauses. So I think it enables the reader to experience it Mm. because there's, You know that nothing is happening for a few seconds there. So you can just take it in and visualize it. Well, that's what I tried to do. (laughs) (laughs) What is your main hope that people will take away from your book? Well, you know, I 
was, like I said, a theater professor. And then I did a doctorate in history of Puerto Rico. And I just became aware of, you know, so many things regarding my own history. And when I was a doctoral student, I brought up Warren Oko in a class. And the professor looked at me like, well, what is she talking about? And the whole classroom turned around and looked at me. And, you know, I realized that they had no idea what I was talking about, where Warnoko was, any of that. And so a long conversation ensued. Um, and I realized that when people think about Puerto Ricans, they mainly place them in Puerto Rico, obviously, and in New York. And there are so many other communities and they're so different from New York. Like this was, I lived, I grew up in these mountains in Massachusetts, completely isolated. So when you compare me with Puerto Ricans in New York, we're totally different in, in some ways. Obviously, it's the city and the country. And so what I wanted people to see is, you know, that... We are a part of the history of this country, and this is another history of this country. Puerto Ricans have been here working and living here, and we're not a part of traditional history here, of traditional literature. And so I think it's my turn, my generation, it's time for us to talk about who we are and, you know, tell those stories. And Simon & Schuster gave me that opportunity. So that's what mainly I want people to know that, you know, we're here and we've been here for a long time. You know, but that's the basic reason why I wrote it. And what was your experience like publishing, working with Simon & Schuster, selling the book, all oh of that? My God. <laughs> I don't want to lead people to think and that it's easy. You know, many times when people ask that question and I say, oh, it was wonderful. It is a wonderful experience, but you have to work. Mm -hmm. You have to be open to criticism. You have to want to improve your writing and your book and your story and the plot and whatever it is that they feel needs to be worked on. So yes, it's a it's an amazing experience. And what about the actual writing? I mean, to go through all of that academic <laughs> rigor, you know, after a full career, that is impressive. Why did you go back? And then when how did this book intersect with all of that? Like how, when did how did you find time to do everything? That's a very interesting question because it all happened because I was living in Puerto Rico and I was a professor there and I had been there most of my life. I grew up in Warren Oco, but at the age of 12, I returned to Puerto Rico and I was there most of my life. And we were there and my husband got this job in the United States that he just, I couldn't, you know, tell him to say no to that. And so we came to the United States and I thought, why don't I write the history of Warnoko since I just finished a PhD in history? And I don't know why, but every time I thought of doing the research, I thought, but I don't want to write about the real people. Mm -hmm. Because doing recent history is, is, you know, has its cons. And I thought, ooh, what is my aunt going to think if I say this? Or, you know, all these people are alive. And I just don't know how it happened. I think there's just something magical about doing art where you just need to do it. You have to do it. You this impulse to do it. And so I started writing and creating these characters that never existed and that was such a liberating feeling for me. After what you've said, after going through all this academic work, all of a sudden, the archive was in my head. You know, <laughs> I didn't have to go sit anywhere and jot down data and 
So it was just a, a liberating experience to be able to create without anyone telling me how to do it. I could just write whatever I wanted. And so I found a way of writing, creating characters that could have lived in Warren Oco, but they didn't. They're all <laughs> made up. <laughs> so it's oddly liberating to just make up whatever you want and it's okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. How is this okay? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, one of the characters, the aunt in the book who is in Puerto Rico and becomes a caretaker for the kids and everything, she, Cecilia, she is non-binary or what, how would you describe how you decided to characterize her? She you know, was called a tomboy back when the mom and her went, were in school together and now as a grown person has, you know, developed, they thought she was a man when she picked them up from the airport. So, and she was, she, you have a beautiful scene where she talks about being accepted for who she is and how important that is. And they can't go Thank on. You. They can't even drive out of the airport without really, without her knowing that her sister still accepts her for who she is. Tell me a little bit about that plot line. Well, when I was doing my doctorate, professors always talked about bringing people out of the margins. You know, history is about kings and queens and politicians. And, you know, for decades now, we've been fascinated by ordinary, common people. We want to know who they were. And, you know, there's so little written about women and children and elderly. And when I wrote this originally, the person who took care of them in Puerto Rico, of the children, was their grandmother. Mm. And I was sitting there one day remembering one of my professors. And I thought, you know, I'm not doing what he said. <laughs> uh, here I'm bringing in a grandmother. It's so, so many grandmothers in Latino literature. And I totally created Cecilia. I said, you know, I need not a stereotype, another stereotype, like all Latinos have these abuelitas everywhere cooking <laughs> in the kitchen. I did not have that. And all Latino women are like, you know, the makeup and the black curly hair and the sex appeal thing going on. And I said, no, there are other people around. Who are they? And I just came up with this person who is Machi. You know, she's more masculine. And this is the, the 50s. So, you know, people couldn't come out. Mm -hmm. But Machi is like, you know, this is who I am. I don't like girls, girl clothes, you know, this is who I am. And so it was just this idea of bringing in a character that is real, that is exists in our society and is also in the margins of literature. You just don't see them as often until recently. I love that. So when you think about your book coming out, what are you worried about, if anything? I'm not worried about anything. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. No, because I feel that I have done an incredible job in terms of my personal satisfaction. That's great. You know, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just, I know that I have given 100% and that this is a story that needs to be told. And if anybody doesn't like it, that's fine. Not everybody likes everything. I don't like everything. <laughs> so, you know, to be here with you and to have all the people on Goodreads and, and all kinds of places saying things about it and holding it up with pictures on the internet, that is amazing. So I've already made it if you mm -hmm. want to put it, you know, it doesn't matter what anybody has to say about it now. I love that. That is so the right attitude. Like that is what everybody needs to hear and remember. I hope they like it. Yeah. Obviously. No, but. I know. I know. But your attitude towards it, because ultimately it's, it's out of your control once it's in the world. Like all you can You're do right. is make sure that you did what you wanted to do and what you set out to do and have total peace with that. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. What else can you do? <laughs> really? 
You hope people will like it. And I hope that they learn from it. You know, basically, you know what it's like to be a child growing up between two cultures, Mm -hmm. having to navigate two cultures, Mm -hmm. two different places coming and going. And then there's one really important thing here. And it's that to me, and it's that you have your family here and they are very Hispanic traditional and then you're going to school and coming home every day so you are changing and your family is having problems with that Mm -hmm. they don't want you to be like americans you know so i'm trying to show the difficulties that children who are brought up between two cultures with parents who just came here Mm -hmm. puerto rico is part of the united states Mm -hmm. so it's not really an immigrant story but culturally, it is. Mm-hmm. Andrea and Pablo have such a close relationship, and I feel like that was really well done. Do you have a sibling that you're very close to, or what I did do. you base that on? You do. I do. Very close in age. Is a brother, sister? He's a he's a brother. Mm-hmm. Yes. Amazing. And has he read the book? He hasn't. No, he's mentally ill. Oh. And so he is the reason why. Pablo has the experiences he has. I wanted to bring that, which is a very personal thing. But I think, you know, we need to talk about mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, why not? And I spoke to him about it. And he said, oh, I can't wait. And he said, you know, I hope the guy has a really good ending with wife, with a wife and kids. So he was all excited, almost that he could see himself in another life. Oh, it was a beautiful experience talking to him about it. Wow. That's great. So Pablo is the character that is closest to a real character. Okay. Pretty much everyone else is completely made up. Hmm. Do you feel that Puerto Rican society is less accepting of mental illness than other places? Or what is the reception of it there? Or has it changed over time? No, we're not less accepting of it. I think, if anything, we accept it more than in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what the exact way of putting this is, but in the United States, there seems to be like a more of a separation of generations with ages Mm -hmm. and illnesses. I just don't know how to put it, but we just kind of are more, just more accepting of each other the way we are. Mm -hmm. Less of a stereotype about what life should be like. Mm -hmm. Family is a big deal. So maybe that is the route to go with this. You know, it's just family, old, young, mentally ill, you know, with whatever illnesses, we're family, period. And it's not so much, it's not as intense here. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm not saying that Americans don't value family. No, no, I, yeah. But just that it's, it's more noticeable in Hispanic culture, how we bind together. Interesting. And did you take inspiration from other Puerto Rican authors or authors in general, or was, were, are there, you know, legends? No? No, because I was a theater professor Mm -hmm. and then I was doing a a doctorate in history. Mm -hmm. I didn't read much literature. I don't know how I wrote this. (laughs) I was not reading (laughs) novels. So I just, I guess I naturally, you know, was gifted or something because (laughs) I didn't read novels. And so... After I started writing it, I did. And that's the one thing I have to say to writers, read in your genre. And so now I read all these novels because I'm not in the academia anymore. And so I can just read anything I want. (laughs) And, And I'm like fascinated. Why did you go back for a PhD in history to begin with? I wanted to stay in Puerto Rico. When I was when I decided to do a PhD, and there is no PhD in theater in Puerto Rico, and I didn't want to leave 
because I have two kids. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to uproot them to come to the United States to do a doctorate. And so I worked out with the history department who does have a doctorate and that I could do all of my research in theater. Got it. Okay. So makes sense now. Got it. (laughs) It's in history of Puerto Rico, but my thesis is from the viewpoint of playwrights. What do playwrights say about Puerto Rican nationality, identity, things like that? But it's still theater. Interesting. Love it. Well, Elba, congratulations on this novel that somehow just you know, flew out of you into the world. Right. You're like a vehicle, you know, like a medium and like other voices are coming out. It's pretty awesome. Um, so congratulations and Thank you. Uh, really wishing you all the best as the, the book launches and, you know, all of that. And then just enjoy the ride. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 